Well, it looks like it's 6.30 and we have a quorum. So welcome to the Thurston County Planning Commission for Wednesday, February 2nd, 2022. This is a virtual meeting on Zoom. Uh, I'm Eric Casino, chair of the board for this term. Uh, and I'd like to just introduce or uh, start this out with a, a word on the commission. The Thurston County Planning Commission is a citizen's advisory commission to the Board of County Commissioners on land use planning matters such as comprehensive plan and zoning ordinance amendments. <clears throat> planning commission actions are in the form of recommendations to the county commissioners who are the final decision makers. All planning commission meetings are open to the public. Citizens are welcome to observe all planning commission briefings and work sessions. Planning, public comment is allowed on those topics for which public hearings have not been held. <clears throat> uh, to start out with, we'd like to do some introductions. So I'll uh, start out with uh, Barry. Uh, Barry Halverson, uh, District 2, Yelm, Washington, Northeastern part of Thurston County. Jim Simmons. You're on mute, Jim. Jim, we can't hear you. Jim, I'll circle back to you in a minute. Helen Wheatley. Hi, I'm Helen Wheatley, District 1, Olympia. Scott Nelson. Scott Nelson, District 3. Doug Carmen. Doug Carmen, District 2. Joel Hansen. Sorry, I was muted. I'm here. You want to introduce yourself, Joel? Well, sure. I'm Joel Hansen, District 3, um, new member. So looking to get up to speed. Thank you. And Kevin Pestinger. Kevin Pestinger, District 1. Jim, are you uh, able to connect now? Maybe not with Jim, but Jim is here and we'll see if he can get this figured out. <clears throat> with that, is there a motion regarding today's proposed agenda? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any dis further discussion? Yes. Commissioner Wheatley? Um, yeah, I actually... Um would like to add an item at the end. I don't think it should take too long, um, maybe five minutes, maybe 10. Um, and that would be discussion of the coming agenda for um, February 16th. And I can, I can explain that now or, or not. Maybe I should take my time on the floor to explain why I'm, I want to do that. Um, I was looking as a new member, I was looking at the rules and procedures and I realized that the agenda isn't quite the same as, um, as what the rules and procedures lay out. And so I'd like to um, talk about that and then. Helen, I think, I think your audio just went out, Helen. I, I think that there's a motion on the floor. So could we get a second and maybe add this to the agenda? Second. Second. All in favor of adding this to our agenda, please say aye. 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 Any abstentions? Okay, we'll be adding that item to the agenda uh, since it's been Moved and seconded. Uh, can we have a uh, call for the vote for the amended agenda to include Commissioner Wheatley's topic? Okay. Aye. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries and we will um, follow the agenda with Commissioner Wheatley's topic at the end. Uh, 
Uh, next on next on our agenda is the uh, approval of the meeting minutes. Is there a motion regarding the approval of last meeting's minutes from January 19th, 2022? I move to approve last meeting, the minutes for last meeting. Is there a second? Second, second from Commissioner Nelson. All in favor of approving the agenda meeting minutes from January 19th, 2022, say aye. 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 Any nays? Motion carries the meetings from January 19th, 2022 are approved. Now is the time when we move into the public communication section of our meetings. For this virtual meeting, please choose the raise your hand option if you wish to address the Planning Commission. I will then promote you to a panelist, or Sonia will promote you to a panelist when it is your turn to speak and be seen. To be seen, please turn on your camera. If you are dialing in, press star nine to raise your hand. And make sure to also choose star six to unmute yourself. The three minute timer will show on one of the video screens to help keep tra track of time. If you have issues speaking, and being heard, please disconnect from the Zoom meeting and call 360-972-6785 to make your public comment. Thank you. So first up, let's see. It looks like the only public comment I have so far is from Charlotte Persons. Can we promote her? Yep. Um, Thank you, Charlotte. We hear you. Again. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm not sure what I can comment on because I think there might have been public hearings, but they might have been a while ago on the HCP and on the, um, the 5G, the, the wireless communications. Am I allowed to comment on those? I'm sorry, Charlotte, we've already had uh, public hearings on those. So those topics are both uh, past time for taking public comment at the Planning Commission. But you will have plenty of opportunities to address those topics to the Board of County Commissioners as they have still not have reviewed those issues. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, Martin Chen, would you like to provide testimony? No, not at this time, thank you. Thank you. Josh Stottlemyer. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so Josh Stottlemyer, unincorporated Thurston County. Uh, I was one of the wireless stakeholder committee, committee members. I'm aware that we're not accepting public comment on um, the wireless uh, stuff at this time. However, I would like to request that you open a second round of public hearings on the wireless code. Uh, later this evening, you'll be asked to, con to uh, continue the direction of development of that code. Um, and on the 16th, you'll be presented with recommendations uh, from the wireless stakeholder committee, which I participated. This code will have long-term implications for every single member of our community and requires more consideration than most choices that will come before your body. And uh, it needs more public comment. We hope you will direct the staff to significantly modify the draft code to increase local control and protections and protect property values, as well as hold a second public hearing before the Planning Commission. The choices that will be laid before you from the Stakeholders Committee are significant, but only a portion of what is truly needed. The community wants a voice in the changes being considered, and I'm aware of many people who still want to comment, uh, we ask that you please give it to them. Uh, thank you for your consideration. Thank, thank you, Josh. Is there any other public comment? Please raise your hand if you'd like to address the Planning Commission. With that, it looks like public comment has concluded. So we'll move on to our next agenda item, which would be an address from uh, Community Planning Economic Development Director, Josh Cummings. Thank you, Josh. Great, thank you, Chair Casino. Hello, Planning Commission. I am Joshua Cummings, the Director of Community Planning and Economic Development, CPED, 
<clears throat> I just wanted to join this evening towards the beginning to say thank you. This is a big lift. I know evenings are precious, and I really appreciate the volunteer citizens uh, participating in this group. This is a really important, as all of our boards and commissions are, but this is really important in terms of the policy that this group reviews for land use and building codes. And we do require that, um, excuse me, we do request <laughs> that you guys engage so deeply in the material uh, that you're able to look at the difficult items and read through all the stuff that staff is presenting you because you really are that first filter of information and then the recommendation that goes to the Board of County Commissioners. So I really appreciate you volunteering to be part of this group that requires so much reading and so much sometimes uh, mental acuity. The goal here is to ensure that the staff is able to facilitate the dialogue with this group and that the um, information that staff brings helps you in your decision making process as that filter to the Board of County Commissioners. The Board of County Commissioners directs the staff and prioritizes their work, uh, but it is important that we work in tandem with the Planning Commission. And I do, let me see here, I wanted to touch on a couple of other things here. Uh, let's see. Oh, I did wanna make sure that you were all aware the Board of County Commissioners is working on a handbook for all boards and commissions and how they operate and uh, any questions that might arise. So be looking for that in the next couple of weeks. We'll bring that forward. Uh, in the meantime, though, I believe that we all have a shared expectation of civil and respectful engagement. And as citizens and residents, you should feel free. If there is a moment where you're feeling that the civility is out of bounds, please do step up. Uh, all of us on this call are humans. So I, the expectation is that all of us can ensure that we maintain a civil dialogue, whether you're staff or uh, a planning commission member. Uh, in the past, I used to, in the before times, I bring my kids to the planning commission meetings. And so you have a seven-year-old and 11-year-old and they're learning what civics looks like. They do sometimes pop in and look at the meeting from time to time. Uh, so do, I do appreciate how civil this group has become and continues to engage. Any questions for me? Yes, please, Commissioner Wheatley. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, you know, I was trying to sort of understand the, the infrastructure, I guess, behind the commission. And um, I'm really wondering what kind of a budget it has and how the, how the budget works or how, how staffing time is budgeted. I mean, can you, can you kind of provide a bit of a picture of what we have to work with? So I saw Chris pop on, which is good. The Planning Commission itself, I do not believe, has a dedicated budget. Is that correct, Chris? Uh, and the work that is done by the staff is by the topics that are assigned by the Board of County Commissioners. So when we go through the docketing process, those items are part of the, essentially funded through the general fund. So the staff and community planning is general fund funded. Is that helpful? Well, sort of, I guess. Um, I mean, I don't want to, you know, I guess I want to understand uh, as a commission member, sort of the range of, uh, you know, I know that um, the commission is, uh, or that you're understaffed right now and don't want to put pressure on staff. And so I want to sort of maybe understand the parameters of of what we as commissioners can ask for or not without causing too much stress on everybody. I think I understand the question. So let me go back to that statement where the Board of County Commissioners is the one that's setting the work plan and the priorities for the staff. If the Planning Commission is interested in having another topic uh, for the staff to explore, that request can go from the Planning Commission to the Board of County Commissioners and they will decide if it's added to the work plan of the staff. Thank you for that, that's helpful. Any other questions for Director Cummings? It doesn't and look like- know, Oh, sorry, go ahead, Chair. No, no, go ahead. If you got something to say, Josh, please say it. I was just gonna say that I'm also available. I might not always come to every meeting, but please do feel free to reach out to me at any time. I am interested in staying engaged and making sure that you all feel served so that you can make your best decisions. I think I see Mr. Peston, the Chair Commissioner Pestinger has uh, his hand up there, Chair Casino. Kevin, please. Thank you, Josh. Yeah. 
so can you, you mentioned a bit about the staffing. Is there anything you can share with us about sort of how many positions are filled and empty and uh, how many you hope to fill over what time frame? Yeah, I appreciated uh, Commissioner Whitney's comment about being understaffed. I think that we're, we're doing okay at this moment. The commissioners uh, allowed for a few extra positions within the community planning budget. Uh, they are considering other options as well. We have a good work plan. You know, it's about a balance between the number of staff we have and the number of issues that we can push through. But also there's you and we don't wanna overload volunteer citizens, residents who have participated in this group. So we've got kind of a couple of different things happening in terms of staffing, Chris, do you want to provide actual direct numbers? Sure. So we are um, hiring for an associate planner position to backfill um, somebody who has left. Um, we are also um, looking to backfill the planning manager's position, and that's in Josh's court. Um, we are. We also uh, received budget for. Um, one full FTE, which will be a project manager to take on um, the a lot of the agricultural um, issues and voluntary stewardship program um, and being that liaison and bridge between um, voluntary stewardship and our permitting, um, but as well as helping with some of the projects that you'll see, um, including the uh, what we call CPA 16, uh, which is the Community Driven Ag Project, um, TDRs, PDRs, kind of the whole suite there. We also did receive um, budget to increase a current 0.5 FTE to a full-time FTE. Um, and that particular person um, has been very much working on climate change issues that will come back before this planning commission once we have a, a a work plan set by the board. Commissioner okay. Benson, is that helpful? Yes, thank you. And you know, let me just take one more minute to do a quick overview of CPED. So CPED, the portion that you're dealing with in community planning, uh, that's the other name for it is long range planning. So it's the vision for what uh, our community members think our community should look like in terms of land use and building. Another portion of our group uh, is called current planning or development services. So that's where the vision gets enacted in the actual building permit codes. You will see some of those development code items come before you as well. Uh, but think of CPED in really big terms. Long range planning, community planning is the vision, the long range vision for our future as a community and development services. Current planning is how that vision is implemented in actual buildings. We also have a service and stormwater group as well as the fair and our partnership with WSU Extension. So this community planning is kind of a big unit, uh, but really it's your portion, your main portion is the vision for our future in our community. So it's a big job, thanks for doing it. Anything else? Kevin, was that everything for you? Yeah, thank you. Great, thanks for coming in. Uh, Director Cummins, and uh, glad to see you. Thank you, Chair Casino. Let me know if there's anything I can do for any of you. Thank you. Thanks for your service. With that, we'll move on to agenda item number five, the work session for A19 wireless communication codes. Uh, I believe that Caitlin Nelson is here to lead this work session. Are you there? Yay. I am. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, good evening, planning commissioners. Uh, I'm Caitlin Nelson. I'm an associate planner in community planning. Um, since it has been a few months uh, since you've reviewed information on uh, uh, related to the wireless code update and we have a few new planning commission uh, members, uh, this work session is just to provide a review of what has been done on the wireless code update uh, and introduce what we'll be discussing at the next work session. Uh, the wireless code update, uh, also known as docket item A19, um, is a repeal and replace of chapter 2033 and uh, includes updates in several other code sections. Um, there have been several work sessions on this item um, and an open public hearing was held on June 2nd, 2021. Uh, this update is necessary to be consistent with the FCC uh, as well as other court cases and legal determinations. 
Uh, in order to efficiently determine uh, what authority the county possesses uh, to make changes around these legal requirements, uh, the county has been working with Ken Fellman, who has presented to the Planning Commission at previous work sessions, uh, and Colleen McCroskey. Uh, they're considered part of Thurston County staff, uh, and they are not representing the wireless industry. Their most recent role has been to listen to concerns from both the wireless industry representatives and community members um, and um, advise staff on which changes would be likely to put the county at risk of significant legal action. During the open public comment period, uh, there were several comments received requesting that community members be more involved in requesting changes to the draft. Uh, planning commissioners provided a request to the Board of County Commissioners to create a committee that reflects this. The board reviewed that and agreed to uh, create a stakeholder committee requesting that it also include wireless representatives uh, and limiting the work to three meetings. Those uh, meetings have taken place. Um, the planning commission after that had uh, determined who to invite to participate in the stakeholder committee at uh, a following work session. Participants included community members Josh Stottlemyer, uh, who spoke earlier, uh, Christy White, Dorothy Lyons, and Sam Milham, um, and regionally local wireless representatives Meredith Paps and Kim Allen, uh, as well as planning commissioners uh, Simmons and Pestinger. Uh, Ken Fellman and Colleen McCroskey also attended these meetings. At the next work session, um, staff will provide the results of the stakeholder committee to you, uh, along with any other associated documents. Um, then we will have a five minute presentation from one or two community member participants of the stakeholder committee uh, and another from the wireless representatives. We can then uh, go over the items um, that are included and summarized um, with the option of determining which items the planning commission would like to see more information on. Um, discussion at these stakeholder committee meetings were largely led by community members. Um, if suggestions went beyond what the county has the legal authority to change, um, it wasn't included in items summarized from the stakeholder meetings. Um, and there wasn't a consistent a consensus agreement on items to include between the community members and the wireless representatives. So suggestions from both will be uh, included in um, the documentation that I provide you. Some suggested items fit well within the scope of an update to this section of code uh, like we would normally do. Um, some may be something that would fit more in other code sections or beyond what would normally be in this type of code, maybe more um, restrictive or um, asking for more information than would normally be in other similar types of land use um, code. Uh, and others are um, procedural. Like I mentioned before, um, I'll be providing that to you at the next work session, um, sort of a breakdown of, um, of how we see each of those items. Um, definitely less than 30 minutes, um, but I, at this time, um, have any, I can answer any questions if I'm able to, or uh, I'd like to hear from you on if there's any information um, or any questions that you have that I could bring back to you at the next work session, since we're going to be getting into so much information. Go ahead, Commissioner Carmen. Uh, Caitlin, can you give us some background on, on uh, Mr. Stoudemire's request? Has there been discussion at the stakeholders meeting about opening up the discussion? Or is there any background or information you want to provide us? Uh, I mean, the members of the stakeholder committee did um, have an interest in holding another public hearing. Um, Commissioner Simmons might be able to speak to that um, because he spoke with them during those meetings about, um, about uh, whether or not they wanted to make that request. Um, Planning Commission has the ability to open another public hearing. It's usually done um, if a significant change has occurred in the draft code. Um, and at this point, uh, staff has not been directed to make any changes to the draft code. So, um, if you, if we review the items from the stakeholder committee and you request that staff uh, make certain changes or look into more information, um, at that point is normally when you would uh, re request holding another public hearing um, to review that updated draft. Commissioner Simmons, can you uh, elaborate on that? Yeah, and, and Caitlin did a great job too chairing that and overseeing that group so I, I'm very very pleased with how that went. I think mostly what 
of what I gathered from the com the community side of the group was they were afraid that they weren't going to be heard and understood. And um, so that was why they wanted to make sure that they were hopefully participating either in the in the conversation with us here or again for the public another public hearing so that was what i gathered and i don't know caitlin you might think it's a little bit different but i think they were just afraid that their message wasn't going to get across uh yeah i, I think there was concern about the uh the time that we were discussing this being limited to three meetings. Uh, and I don't wanna misrepresent them by trying to summarize uh, what their concerns were. Um, so that's part of why um, we're hoping that they can voice some of that at their uh, presentation at the next work session. Commissioner Wheatley. Yeah, I'm just looking for a little clarity on process here. Um, I'm, I'm a newbie, so this is all new for me. Um, so, so if I heard you correctly, Caitlin, sort of the procedure would be that um, at the next meeting, we're going to sort of get the whole package to con the, you know, up till now. And then if the commission wants to propose some change or to consider some change to the draft or to whatever it is that you present at that point, because you're saying there hasn't been a change so far to the, to the draft changes or to the, to the draft. Um, yeah, correct. The most recent draft at that point, at that point, at the next meeting, if, if the commission wanted to have another hearing, that's the time at which they would say, we're interested in a change. We'd like to have a hearing on that. Is that right? That's kind of the steps of the procedure. If the commission were to want to have a further hearing. Chris, did you want to say anything on that? Sure, I can chime in. Um, typically, we would, if the Planning Commission has within their purview to ask for staff to open up another public hearing for a particular project. That typically occurs when there is substantial significant change to the draft. Because uh, there is another public hearing after the planning commission's recommendations um, that is with the board of county commissioners so this isn't the last time the public can provide their comments um, they did provide their comments and input during the stakeholder meeting group and you will hear that next week uh, in their own words from their representatives um, and they will be able to provide additional testimony um, on the recommendation uh, at the Board of County Commissioners public hearing. Um, but again, it is within the Planning Commission's purview if they so chose that there was significant change to open up a public hearing again. So yeah, just to be really clear, you know, to understand the steps. So, so far the Planning Commission has not proposed substantial changes in its discussions. So the next meeting would be sort of the time if it wants to see substantial changes, that would be the time to bring those up at, at, this, at the next meeting, because that's when we're gonna be getting the packet. Yes, uh, but the request to hold another public hearing based on substantial, substantial changes would be after you receive another copy of that updated draft. And um, if it's determined that that is a substantial change. Um, at this next meeting, we'll just be looking for direction from planning commission on what you want to see changes to and then i'll have to come back later with what those might look like Thank when uh, the planning commission forwards the recommendation to the board of county commissioners will the uh, subcommittee's reports be fully um, encompassed in that uh, and forwarded to the planning commission or forward to the uh, commissioners at the same time uh, I would be providing the board with um, with all of the information that I provided you. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I hope so. <laughs> Great, thank you. Do we have any other questions for Caitlin this evening? Like Kevin? No. Caitlin, did you have anything else for us this evening? 
No, I just wanted to make sure that there was uh, time to ask any questions, um, just because it's a there's a lot of information involved. Um, and I'll be sending out an update of all of the previous documents that you've been um, provided as well. So, yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll be moving on to item six on our agenda work session for the Habitat Conservation Plan from Chris Chapeau. Good evening. I don't know what time it is anymore. Um, I am Christina Chapeau. I'm senior planner, well, I'm the interim planning manager for community planning. Uh, in Community Planning and Economic Development Department. And yes, we will be um, starting the review of the Habitat Conservation Plan um, Implementing Ordinance. I have a brief PowerPoint presentation that I really hope is gonna work. So please bear with me a moment. All right, seeing my presentation. <clears throat> so the goal of today's briefing is to learn more about the HCP implementing ordinance and um, to generate and receive questions from the planning commission. Um, I expect that there will be a lot of questions and uh, we'll take the implementing ordinance section by section. This um, is a development code docket item. It is 8A on the development code. Um, the codes that are proposed for change um, are Title 17 with a new code, a new chapter, um, 1714, and um, targeted changes to uh, Title 24, which is the critical areas ordinance, specifically in chapter 2425, which is the fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas. Um, we'll talk more about that, but what we don't want to do is have um, conflicting or overlapping uh, codes or requirements that make um, things more difficult or um, create muddy waters for applicants. We want to make sure that we're providing a streamlined path. And the benefits of the Habitat Conservation Plan and the implementing ordinance um, as it provides a path for project approval with endangered or threatened species that are covered by the HCP. It provides certainty for the next 30 years and it provides for threatened endangered species protections. So the HCP implementing ordinance, what does it do? Um, it adopts the habitat conservation plan it provides the regulatory basis to implement and enforce it. It describes when the code applies and to whom it applies. It provides the permit review mechanisms um, to staff and public in an understandable format, because if any of you have had a chance to review the HCP, you know it is very thick and it is written for the federal government. Um, it also describes the administrative processes. What it doesn't do is open up the Habitat Conservation Plan for changes. The HCP is a mitigation plan um, that was developed uh, in concert with stakeholders and with the Board of County Commissioners direction to obtain a permit um, from the federal government. So there will be areas that um, there may be questions about, we can do some clarifications on, um, but any areas where uh, there is a request for change that changes the HCP, uh, those are areas that we are not going to be able to make those amendments to. So what is changing? Um, well, got a new ordinance. Um, the gopher study that has been going on um, once the HCP implementing ordinance is adopted, once we receive an ITP and it's adopted, um, there will be no more need for a gopher study. So the June to November uh, timeframes will uh, go away and most applications will only need a desktop review. Now sites with Oregon spotted frog um, within the Oregon spotted frog screen um, and have wetlands will need a site visit. Uh, and there are procedures that are laid out um, in Appendix F and we'll go through those. It also provides for mitigation options, which is the um, 
I think one of the biggest bonuses for of the HCP is that people don't have to go out and figure out what that mitigation needs to be, where it is, and how to purchase it. There are three options written into the um, Habitat Conservation Plan, and that's a fee in lieu that is land in lieu, so somebody could provide, if it's uh, appropriate um, and meets the requirements, they could provide land in, um, in lieu of paying that fee. Or if there are mitigation banks out in the um, out in our area, then they could purchase um, conservation credits through that particular mitigation bank, so long as it was approved by U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So I'm gonna stop there and let people know that they can find more information about the HCP. And um, after tonight, they'll be able to find a copy of the implementing ordinance at thurstonhcp.org. I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna reshare and we're gonna start going through the um, ordinance itself. I did see questions though, before I start. Go ahead, Commissioner Wheatley. Uh, yeah, just a real quick, quick question. Um, what do we know about the timeline for when um, Fish and Wildlife is going to come back with an approval? And what happens if they don't approve the plan as submitted? I mean, what if there need to be some changes? So um, we've been doing those iterative changes for the past well, number of years. Um, and this last draft four, um, we've had some clarification changes that have, excuse me, have, have occurred. Um, but we don't see any reason why U.S. Fish and Wildlife wouldn't approve the uh, Habitat Conservation Plan and issue the incidental take permit. As far as the timeline is concerned, um, I can give you broad generalizations, but we don't have control over um, their processes. So we are looking to have a final um, final EIS, excuse me, a final environmental impact statement um, published at the end of March. Yes, at the end of March. Um, there will then be a 30-day hold on Fish and Wildlife making any um, formal agency actions, uh, which is when they'll be doing all their paperwork to get the all of their necessary things in order. And we could see as early as mid-April um, an incidental take permit from U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Um, now that is barring any additional changes or challenges during the hold period um, or yeah, any foreseen circumstance, unforeseen circumstances. Um, once the incidental take permit is um, issued, we will then be able to um, finalize uh, and lock down uh, any language in, in the implementing ordinance um, that may very well need to be amended based on some uh, minor clarifications that have been done. <clears throat> so that's, that's the time frame. Commissioner Simmons. Yeah, when you when you say a hold period, is that an additional period that where uh, the public would would be able to supply more input, and also is this going to be something that if if that's the case, would this be advertised out there or not advertised, but would this be posted that additional input could be made? Right. So the hold period is actually an appeal period. <laughs> so they aren't taking additional comment. Um, the, uh, and yes, it will be, it will be noticed and published um, in the federal register. The county will um, issue um, a uh, press release uh, for the, um, the, no the publication of the final EIS. I did want to mention one additional thing. So, you know, we get there are there are a number of 
moving parts to this entire program. The incidental take permit is just one of them. The implementing ordinance is another piece, but there is also the conservation land system um, out there that needs to be created. Uh, and the county is working diligently to find and to work with willing sellers, um, but the conservation land system is the mitigation. And without that conservation land system, um, in place or a portion of that in place, um, being able to issue those permits under an incidental, under the incidental take permit would be prohibited. We have to have the credits or the mitigation in place prior to allowing impacts. So, um, you know, staff is working a number of different um, pieces of the overall um, program. But tonight is how if it's all that's in place, what does the what do the rules look like? Okay. Let's see if I can share. a quick question. Yeah. So there was already a public hearing on the HCP? No, there has not been a public hearing on the Habitat Conservation Plan. Okay, thank you. Maybe share. All right. Can everybody see that? Maybe I'm going to zoom in a little bit. All right. So uh, as I previously mentioned, this is a new chapter, so we're not repealing or replacing anything. We're plunking in a new chapter into Title 17. Uh, we did not get creative in the name. It is the Habitat Conservation Plan or HCP Implementing Ordinance. We don't wanna confuse the public. Everybody knows uh, um, the Habitat Conservation Plan and, uh, and the acronyms, so we kept it simple. It does incorporate by reference the Habitat Conservation Plan as it will be approved um, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Um, so it may not be exactly what you've currently seen um, to date. Uh, that final draft, HCP, or the final HCP will be issued uh, upon issuance of the incidental take permit. And that is the document that will be incorporated by reference. The purpose of the Habitat Conservation Plan in implementing ordinance is to establish the comprehensive framework to protect con um, and conserve rare, threatened, and endangered species while improving and streamlining the environmental permitting process um, for impacts of future development on these species. It establishes uh, the procedures to implement uh, the Thurston Habitat Conservation Plan, uh, which provides the basis for permits and authorizations necessary for lawful take of covered species which have been listed as threatened or endangered pursuant to the ESA. Uh, that's a big long statement to say this gives us the um, legal authority to implement and enforce. I see a question, yes. Well, it may be, um, I don't know how we're moving forward on this, but I would like to make a comment on the purpose on 17.40.015. Would this be the time to do that? Sure. Quickly. Um, okay. Well, I appreciate that it does reference the Endangered Species Act, um, which is kind of the genesis of this. I think it can be, it's often customary to um, go into some detail about um, uh, if you're talking about purpose, um, this is the place where um, the county can sort of talk about why it's trying to save these species, you know, what, what sort of the parameters are of the Endangered Species Act and to, and to discuss, you know, what, what the goals and aims of the Endangered Species Act are. Um, I think this is maybe not, if somebody is coming to this, they're not getting a sense of, of direction about what the county wants to accomplish with this. 
you know, in other words, um, for example, there's a, a tendency to think that the Endangered Species Act is sort of like how we think about um, the Shoreline Management Act and the idea of no net loss. But in fact, if you read the Endangered Species Act, the goal of the act is to take the endangered species out of danger. Um, it, it, no, it's, its goal is to take them off of the list because they have what they need. And I think it would be um, a good thing to include that as the purpose of, of this code. So that's just a comment. Any other discussion? Well, I would, I would think that that's actually in the habitat conservation plan. And I think that's a lot more detail than we want in our comprehensive plan. Well, there's no rule against detail. Particularly, I mean, it's kind of, it may be partly a, an aesthetic question. It might be a policy question. I'd be interested to know what others think about that. It's not that unusual though for, 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 um, for purpose to be kind of more, this is the place where you can really talk about it in grand terms. Yeah, this is the HCP. It seems relevant and appropriate to put it here. Go ahead, Commissioner Carmen. I think it. I think it states well enough in this section. We can't get too involved in explaining everything over and over again. Um, so I agree with Scott. I think it, it's covered in the habitat conservation conservation plan. Commissioner Hansen. I would just comment that I don't see any language like the word restore. You know, it says that it's uh, to protect and conserve rare and threatened endangered species, but um, I, I don't see anything positive in terms of, uh, you know, restoring the species or, or anything to that effect. And so maybe we could add something uh, like that in there. Yeah, and I'd like to, um, comment on that, if I may, Chair. So we have to remember that the Endangered Species Act um, is the charge of U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, and federal government. What we're doing is ensuring that our our, our uh, county capital facility projects and um, the development projects that come into our permitting center are covered. Um, for incidental take. That does not uh, mean that we're uh, recovering the species. Um, that is the charge of U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Our only requirement under the law is to make sure that we are mitigating our impacts, and that's what the Habitat Conservation Plan is doing. Commissioner Wheatley. However, the statement of purpose references the necessarily references the Endangered Species Act, and like I said, it's it's not at all unusual to see language that explains um, what the true purpose is, and and it is restorative, and we do not have to construe the language so narrowly if we don't choose to. And I think it's important to keep that in mind um, because this is, this is something that's gonna um, essentially be for 30, you know, it's a, it's a 30 year cycle and people can remember or forget things over 30 years. And I think it's often helpful to have some reference to what the intention is. Um, it's, it's not necessarily always the case that um, for the public reading the code that they're going to go back and look at the ESA and then understand how that relates to who has what jurisdiction over it. The state and the county and other um, jurisdictions are working on behalf of the federal government. It's not 
you know, it's, it's, a, it's a responsibility that's delegated to us to carry this out, but we are doing something that is a, in line with a federal act with a purpose, and it doesn't hurt to put that purpose into the code. Commissioner Halverson. Uh, yeah, Chris, I'm just uh, just a bit of clarification. What we're going through right now with you is the actual update to the environmental ordinance of the Habitat Conservation Plan, not the conservation plan itself, which is this other 194 page document. Is that correct? That is correct. This is the, okay. the ordinance that implements it. So the ordinance quite uh, literally is going to be a much smaller document to put in the ordinance. The the HCP itself actually goes into quite a bit of detail on vision, goals, purpose, and need, uh, which, which is where it should be. Um, I'm not saying that additional clarification on purpose is not necessary, but this is the, uh, the ordinance uh, that enforces the HCP that's 194 pages and includes a lot more detail. Thank you. Commissioner Hansen. I, I would just comment that it, I don't think it takes a lot of language in this section to get to the big idea, to purpose. What is the purpose of this thing? And if the Endangered Species Act says that, that the goal is to restore these species, to take them off the list, that seems like the big idea. And, and then all the details about how we get there, um, yeah, put those in the larger document, but, but let's at least come out and say what it is we're hoping to accomplish so that 30 years from now uh, or in the in the next 30 years people can look at this and clearly understand oh this is this is the intention and and maybe there's different paths to get there but the idea is that not that we you know come up with ways to to uh, you know meet the requirements when when we very well may just you know, have some of these species, you know, go extinct in Thurston County by meeting the requirements. The purpose is to try to not have that happen and try and establish populations that can can uh, thrive in such a way that, that they're no longer need to be listed. Is there any other discussion on this particular portion of, of uh, the presentation? Chris, if you want to move forward, that would be great. Sure. Okay. So, um, and we're getting into the bit more of the meat um, of this. So, the applicability: um, who is required to um, go through this review, um, and what we've envisioned and what we've um, put in the plan is that um, basically any development that requires um, a planning permit, uh, they will need to have a uh, review to determine if they have habitat on their property and if their habitat, if there is covered species habitat on their property, then this particular review will be required. Um, that includes projects that have what is considered, that are considered vested. And there is no vesting in federal law. Um, so should an applicant who has already submitted their application, um, who has um, gopher soils or has tailor checker spot butterfly or organ spotted frog, habitat on their property um, be impacting those, that habitat or those species, then they would need to provide mitigation either through the habitat conservation plan or provide some other um, documentation to show that they meet the ESA requirements um, in order for them to move forward. And we can talk a little bit more about how that all works, but 
there are some projects that do not need to go through this particular review. And um, a vast majority of those projects would be those that have already received uh, a Mazama Paka Gopher review completed prior to the effective date of this particular um, ordinance. Um, and it lays out specifically that they needed to meet the U.S. Fish and Wildlife guidance for assessing potential take, um, which is a document that was um, received by the county in 2018 and how we've been implementing those, uh, the current review of um, gophers or projects on gopher soils. Um, if they have a building permit that's gone through that review and um, but they haven't started construction, they, they're good to go. They don't need to come back in for anything else from us. Um, if they received the, um, what we call a uh, critical area documentation um, or permit review um, in that particular document um, is still valid, then they don't need, and, and it showed that they didn't have gophers, um, we clarify that, then they're good um, to move on to the next steps for development. Um, mining applications won't go through. They are not subject to the Habitat Conservation Plan. It's not that they aren't subject to the ESA. It's just that they are not a covered activity under our um, Habitat Conservation Plan. So they would need to provide documentation to the county showing that they have gone through and received um, an individual or incidental take permit for their project. Um, projects that um, are working within an existing building footprint, they don't need to uh, have this review. And then projects for which U.S. Fish and Wildlife has issued, this is very technical language, thank you to the attorneys. Um, basically what that says is if U.S. Fish and Wildlife has issued them an incidental take permit, and that's the 10A1B, or it is a project that was subject to what we call Section 7 consultation. And those are typically um, projects that, a good example would be a county roadway project where we receive federal funding. Um, federal funded projects or federal, federal projects need to have a uh, federal to fe federal consultation and that would fall under Section 7. So they would have had a review. They don't need to go through another one. Demolition permits don't need them. Um, and properties which are fully forested, um, which are confirmed by staff, don't need to um, have this. They are not habitat for the Mazama pocket gopher, the uh, Taylor checker spot butterfly, or the Oregon spotted frog. And then um, there is a, an exemption in the in, or excuse me, in the um, endangered species, excuse me, the listing for the Mazama pocket gopher. And it, this is only for the Mazama pocket gopher. And we call that this the 4D rule. Um, there are a number of items that do not um, need, that were need a review under the HCP because they were not considered a project that would take a species. And a large portion of those projects would be um, Agricultural related. I saw. Yeah, Chris, uh, I don't know the answer to this. I, th I thought it was one year, but A3, it says the review building permit has not expired. Is that typically one year from date of application and approval, or does that change depending on the type of project? It does depend on the underlying project. Building permits typically are, are valid for three years. Three years, okay. But they may so, have a additional permits that extend that out. Okay, but it would say that clearly on their permit as to what the expiration date is. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So I'll stop there and if there are any other questions um, or clarifications that we can provide in this section. Commissioner Carmen. Yes, the... Uh... This section it says it's for all, or uh, uh, they require all projects that require a permit. So is that that other than these exclusions that you have here, does that mean all? Yes, that means all. Any project, any area that would impact uh, the um, 
clacker gopher or uh, the covered species. I guess I'm I'm confused. Maybe it's just I don't understand how you, the the park gopher uh, areas are established. But I know of two specific parcels that somebody um, uh, built a house on, and they had to do a, a pocket gopher inspection and another property that's going to build a house on and they have to do the same thing both pieces of property are glacial till where it's 90 percent rock and 10 percent uh dirt and i you know gophers can't live in that environment so i'm wondering why parcels with that kind of uh, soil would require a pocket gopher inspection so I wouldn't be able to answer that without knowing um, which um, parcels those are or what soils um, the federal government did list out um, specifically which soil complexes are considered um, pocket gopher habitat. And those are the soils that are mapped um, preferred or more preferred, more preferred or less preferred um, in the county's geodata system. So do you go by parcel, parcel by parcel or by area? Does that map? That, I'm not understanding the question. Um, so it, is the soil classified parcel by parcel or by area? So the soil classifications were done by, I guess, area. Um, they're, I mean, NRCS um, actually does the soil classifications. We pick up the um, soils map from the conservation, um, soils conservation and overlay that on the, the county and then overlay the parcels on top of that so that you know what kind of soils you have within um, your parcel. Okay, I'll, I'll send you the two parcels because I just need to understand. Sure. Then you can let me know. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions on this topic? Oh, Commissioner Wheatley. Yeah, um, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm actually wanting to do a bit of a time check and I have a question about process again because we have 15 minutes on more to go on this item. And I'm wondering um, when when we got the packets, there was one question um, that was sort of posed in that. And I'm wondering, Christina, if you would like us to talk about that question tonight, because it seems like we only have 15 minutes to go. Uh, um, that would be great if we could um, talk about that, because I could then develop something and put it in for the Planning Commission to review. Well, may I propose that we just jump ahead to talking Please. about administration and especially that that one question about 174110. Please do Commissioner Wheatley. Okay, great. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give the first input then on that because um, the question that was posed um, was there's language about um, creating an HCP implementation team. And I know a lot of people are very concerned. Uh, you know, this, this whole approach is kind of a relatively new one for how conservation plans are put together. It's more familiar. This, this kind of approach is, is kind of familiar and recognized as being, you know, pretty successful for wetlands, but it's not so common to have it applied for prairies. And then on top of that, we have like a very unique prairie. Um, so I know there's a lot of concern about enforcement uh, in the HCP and this particular part of it, 174110, is the really key element in the enforcement. I think there's a lot of concern that a lot of the things that are, that might be considered kind of under the enforcement side, there's a fair bit of danger of sort of trying to get the horse back in the barn after it's been let out in, in terms of permitting and then the actual effects of permitting on whether that's gonna lead to 
um, protection of the species. So the, the HCP implementation team is really, really important uh, on, the, on the enforcement end of things. And I absolutely support including it because the language and um, you know, maybe it'd be good to sort of send that out to planning commission members, the, the, the actual language behind the HCP implementation team. Um, but the language that I see, it, it not only talks about what that team does, but for me, what's really also very important about it is it also says, it specifies who is gonna be on that team. And it says the HCP implementation team will be composed of county staff and three to five biologists who collectively have experience with conservation agricultural practices and the covered species and their habitat types. Now, I might want to, you know, we might want to explore whether that's the absolutely right membership. I might want to specify biologists who have experience in conservation agricultural practices and you know the particular endangered species or something like that but i think it's really important to specify who the team members are for this because it plays such an important role so i absolutely support um, including that so that's my answer to your question <laughs> thanks And I, I was gonna say I was gonna give a little bit more um, description of the HCP implementation team and the roles and responsibilities um, that are envisioned for this team. Um, this particular team would help the county adaptively, adaptively manage the criteria for selecting conservation lands. Um, they would be reviewing um, proposed changes to standards um, in perf to performance standards or site evaluation protocols. Um, and this would be for our mitigation sites, um, not necessarily for our development, um, but these are our mitigation site performance standards. Um, they would be reviewing the progress towards meeting the HCP commitments and the incidental take conditions, incidental take permit conditions, and review that annual report um, prior to submission, um, prior to providing it to the Board of County Commissioners and submission to US Fish and Wildlife, which is an annual um, submission. Um, they would be providing guidance for the conservation uh, land system restoration management activities monitoring um, as we move into uh, the future years um, we know climate change is um, something that we need to be concerned with and are there do we need to adaptively change or manage how we manage the land um, they would be providing input there as well as coordinating as requested um, a, a guidance and recommendations for conservation measures, um, land issues, and covered species needs, um, providing guidance for integration with other monitoring and research efforts, because WDFW, um, DNR, and um, WSU do do a lot of research out on the prairies um, for a, a number of different things that are conservation related, um, as well as providing program improvement recommendations um, in the program implementation to staff. So just wanted to provide that. I will um, make sure that everybody has a copy of 7.2.3 so you can read it for yourselves. Commissioner Halverson. Uh, yeah, I, I concur with Commissioner Wheatley on that. It, when you when you have a section right below it that talks about appeals and then another section that talks about enforcement, and, uh, and you need to have something in there that talks about how they're going to get the information, um, I think putting the definition in the ordinance itself is a good idea, Chris. Okay, I can work something out. Do we have any other questions for Chris on this topic? Chris, do you have anything more to present on this topic? Uh, 
today, no. Um, I will bring, <laughs> uh, I can bring this back and we can um, go through. Are there any, I guess, I would ask if there are any particular sections that the Planning Commission wants to dive into um, so that I'm not going through this section by section and reading it to you. Um, no one wants me to do that for, for sure. <laughs> Is there anybody on the commission that would like to focus the efforts or where they should be focused at? All right, well, thank you for your presentation this evening. We'll be moving on to agenda item seven, which is a work session on the Shoreline Master Program presented by Andrew DeFobis. Andrew? Okay, uh, good evening Planning Commission. My name is Andrew DeFobis. I'm an interim senior planner with Thurston County Community Planning. I'll go ahead and share my screen and launch a PowerPoint for this evening. Okay, so hopefully that is up and running. Uh, this evening uh, we will have a continuation of the conversation that the Planning Commission began uh, at the last meeting. So we're gonna look at some requests from citizens to re-review select shoreline environment designations, comments that came out of the public comment period uh, for the public hearing that the Planning Commission just had on the draft. Uh, I also did attempt to bring back um, some information the Planning Commission asked for as best as I was able to. Uh, and we can talk about that when we get down into the specific um, case study here. Um, but essentially, um, yeah, the, tonight and at the next couple meetings, uh, we'll take a look at the requests from citizens, at the any analysis and recommendations I was able to put together. Um, and, you know, the Planning Commission does have the latitude to uh, propose revisions to shoreline environment designations consistent with the designation criteria uh, in, in the SMP. And so tonight, uh, we'll, it's a, the same set I had for you last time because we didn't get through everything. Uh, there, it, we'll look at one on Bud Inlet. We've got two uh, requests from Long Lake and then one each from Summit and Pittman Lake. And all the uh, citizen requests were in the written public comment record and are available on our website and have previously been distributed to the Planning Commission. So I gave a bit more background last meeting. I'm not going to go into the whole spiel on shoreline environment designations, but I did at least want to slide in here that discussed it briefly. Um, also, I put together a memo for the Planning Commission, uh, just a summary of all things Shoreline Master Program, not intended to be comprehensive on every topic, but to give a good overview for our new members of some of the background and the, the, the planning framework, and then also where this effort has been to date. So to state it as briefly as I can, um, Shoreline Environment Designations are one element of a Shoreline Master Program update. They control what uses are allowed in, uh, in the shoreline and what permits are needed and also how and which development standards are going to apply. Um, the, the, all that work is based on uh, inventory and characterization that is done earlier in the shoreline master program update process. And that paints a picture of the existing conditions on the shoreline how much have they been developed or modified, uh, what's the vegetation like, what ecological function are these areas providing, what is the zoning and land use and future intended uses of these areas, all that information provides a snapshot um, to, to build the rest of, of the document, including the env environment designations. And generally speaking, I've got the five that are included in the master program up here, and there's sort of a, a continuum, right? So uh, the natural shoreline environment designation is proposed in general for shorelines that are more intact and are less degraded. Uh, on the other end of things, you have the shoreline residential environment designation, which is proposed for shorelines that have been more impacted and feature more dense residential development. And then in between those two uh, ends are uh, rural and urban conservancy that, you know, are still providing function, have some environmental limitations, but also feature some degree of development and may or may not be um, you know, situated close to an urban area. And then of course, below the ordinary high watermark, we've got the aquatic shoreline environment designation. So some things to keep in mind as we think about all this uh, is that you know, all these shoreline reaches we're gonna look at 
might not fit neatly in one box. They might meet the criteria of more than one or some of one SED and some of another. Um, but what I'm hoping for uh, from Planning Commission is a recommendation on the best fit based on the ground conditions and the criteria that we have. Um, the SED or environment designation system is only one component of ensuring no net loss of ecological function, which is a requirement of the Shoreline Master Program. And uh, obtaining that goal is something that I'd like the Planning Commission to keep in mind as we review these as well. And uh, we'll be looking only at mapped jurisdiction. So the actual uh, extent of a property that's going to be uh, uh, subject to the master program is determined in the field. So we, we've got maps that, that represent the best uh, ability to show what we think are going to be subject to the master program, but it's got to be confirmed in the field when we're doing an application review. And of course, um, shoreline environment designations and the SMP as a whole are only one piece. Uh, it's only one factor that's going to potentially affect how shorelines can and will be developed. Okay. So we'll start with the uh, reach that we looked at the last time, um, which was on Bud Inlet, it's Zangle Cove, reach Bud Inlet 16 to 17. And uh, so we looked at this last time, I tried to bring back some more information in the slides here. So we're, I'm looking for a recommendation from Planning Commission on the whole reach. Um, some of these things will be more parcel specific as we get further in, but this is uh, for the whole reach. Uh, Chair Casino, I see a question. Go ahead, Commissioner. Yeah, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Nope, you're up. Okay, yeah, uh, just there was a question at the last meeting about um, whether there were steep banks as part of this. It wasn't me that asked that, but it seems like an important question because um, since that last meeting, I found out that Zangle Cove is Pigeon Guillemot. Um, territory and that means banks, I believe. So I'm curious to know if you were able to find out um, if there's steep banks on this por uh, parcel. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna touch on that. Yes, I will touch on that. So I was gonna run through um, the the presentation I gave last time and then conclude with the new information that I have for the, for the Planning Commission. But yes, I do have information on that. and. Um, so yes, so stay tuned. Okay, uh, and yes, uh, I'll, I'll count on you all to let me know when there's a question uh, or a hand raise, I can't see all, all the faces. Um, okay, so what we're looking at here uh, in the left-hand side of your screen is just a map that's intended to give you a, a general picture of where we're talking about in the county here, the yellow circle on that map. This is in the Boston Harbor area, north of Olympia. And uh, to the right is a, is a picture that shows the reach itself bounded by the yellow squiggly lines. Um, currently, this reach is um, residential, or excuse me, it's a rural shoreline environment designation. Uh, the two parcels in the southeastern corner are conservancy, but the vast majority of it is rural. The proposed shoreline environment designation in the draft is rural conservancy. Uh, the citizen request is that this be returned to a shoreline residential SED um, as previous drafts had reflected. So uh, this was this one was touched on by uh, several comment letters. I've listed them out there for anyone who wants to go back and take a look at those specifically. Uh, and I'm summarizing here some of the things that that folks discussed. Um, that you know this this whole reach is part of the original Boston Harbor plat and has a uh, limited area of more intense rural development zoning district, which uh, you know enables more dense development than other rural zoning districts in the county, uh, and that the area is also served by a sewer system. Commenters uh, discussed how the area has been residential for a long time, um, and that there are homes that are close to the water that have man all manner of modifications, including armoring lawns and decks, um, that native vegetation has been removed in some places, and that this area appears to be similar in character to other areas that are proposed to be shoreline residential. Uh, one thing to touch on here on the sewer, I, you know, I, I've heard from, from the folks who live out here that, that all these areas are on sewer. I looked into it. I couldn't find 
um, in the time that I had, you know, a map that showed that they every single parcel is, but I, to my understanding, a lot of this area is sewered. So I think for the purposes of the conversation, we should be considering that it is largely sewered, if not wholly sewered in this area. Um, okay, so I'll go through. Uh, so again, the way this is structured is just showing showing the reach and then alongside the criteria and um, to go into some analysis here. So uh, I've got the criteria on the left from each of these SEDs and then information I was able to find uh, from the inventory and characterization report or the SED report and then notes that I had put together um, which are not finalized by any means. So any changes that do occur to um, any of these reaches based on planning commission discussion, I'll be you know, having to do a write-up that goes as a supplement to our um, SED report moving forward. But these are notes in my, that represent my thoughts to date. So uh, looking at the criteria, uh, is this reach outside of incorporated municipalities, outside of urban growth areas? Yes, it is. Uh, and is it supporting low intensity re resource based uses? Uh, no, it is not. The primary use of this reach is residential development. Um, and so that goes to the third bullet point. Is it accommodating residential uses? Yes, it is uh, with varying intensity and distance from the shoreline as I was able to observe from aerial photography. Um, does the area support or the reach support human use but is subject to environmental limitations? And the answer to that from my analysis is yes, uh, it is supporting human uses. Uh, the mapping out there does indicate the presence of steep slopes uh, and the presence of bluffs that appear to be of varying height. Can the area support low intensity water dependent uses uh, without significant adverse impact? Um, it would appear that low intensity uses may be more appropriate in the areas that have intact vegetation and perhaps have more function that could potentially be impacted. Uh, again, I want to draw back to that conversation about no net loss as a requirement of the SMP. Uh, is there private or publicly owned lands of high recreational value or historic, cultural, or potential for public access? There's limited public access opportunity out here. These are all smaller parcels in individual private ownership. I didn't see anything listed in those reports or on geodata um, for, you know, um, public access or for cultural sites, although again, I would point out the, the significance of the whole of Puget Sound to the tribes in the area. Uh, and then does it meet the presentation or does it not meet designation criteria for the natural environment? And it does not appear to just based on um, the level of development that is out there. So looking now to the shoreline residential criteria. I'm getting my notes to scroll. Okay, great. Uh, so does it that one, the first criteria for the shoreline residential SED is that it does not meet the criteria for either the natural or rural conservancy environment. And as I just mentioned, it does not appear to meet the criteria for natural. Um, portions of this reach do appear to meet some of the criteria for rural conservancy, although portions of this reach are also more densely developed and perhaps, you know, do not meet that criteria. Uh, is it predominantly single family or multifamily residential development or platted and planned as such? Um, it is a Lammert, again, it is an area rec that is zoned for more intense rural development, and the vast majority of these lots do contain residential development. Um, I think there might only be a couple that do not. I want to be clear that it is, these lots do have residential development on them. Um, and many homes are close to or within the buffer that that shoreline residential designation would provide, and there are shoreline modifications associated with those. And uh, is the majority of the lot within shoreline master program jurisdiction? Yes, this appears to be true for virtually all the lots in the reach as best as we're able to estimate because the ordinary high water mark is not something that is actually mapped until we go into the field uh, as part of a project review. And uh, has ecological function been impacted by more intense modification than use? This is again something that seems to vary across the reach. Um, there, some lots are more developed than others with varying degrees of vegetation removal, um, distance of the homes to the water and presence of things like shoreline armoring or docks. Uh, on either end of the reach, there appear to be you know, higher banks uh, with wider strips of vegetation between the primary residential structures and the water, which suggests that uh, ecological function, uh, there may be more function in those areas. 
So turning now to some of the newer information that was requested at the planning last planning commission meeting, um, I did go ahead and uh, I didn't show the map of the steep slopes, which comes from our critical areas ordinance, but virtually all of these um, properties, except for I think about three or four lots in the center of the reach here are mapped as having steep slopes. And that is an indicator uh, that, that we use, you know, based on the soil types that we have out there that Chris kind of touched on that soil type mapping in her presentation, based on our soil mapping, based on our topography and our LIDAR and all the best information we have about the conditions out here uh, reflects that perhaps there may be the presence of steep slopes does show up on, on uh, almost all of these lots. But what I thought would be more useful here is to kind of to show you the topography. And so here I took a screenshot of this reach with um, the topo lines on. These are 10 foot contour lines. So this reach, uh, if you can see my cursor, Kind of starts right here where my cursor is uh, and you go up and around the point there and then um, as you come off this photograph pick up here and come down uh, to the reach ends right about here that's where that creek flows out into zangle cove um, and uh, same contour lines but instead of just the background image it's uh this shows the lidar so it, it gives a, a digital representation of of the ground out there there were questions about the stream that flows into Zangle Cove. So I did some digging on that in our geodata system and talked to some of our staff. Uh, and I do wanna point out and remind folks that only a small portion of this stream is actually likely to be within shoreline jurisdiction. So yes, it, is, it flows into a water body that is a shoreline, but um, the stream itself is not, uh, is not a shoreline of the state. So only the portion of the stream that crosses shoreline jurisdiction that essentially 200 feet landward of the ordinary high water mark, uh, only that area would be subject to the master program. Um, the, the rest of it would be subject to the critical areas ordinance and any other um, codes, but I just wanna make that distinction. Um, so as far as our mapping goes, this area, uh, this stream is mapped as a type five stream, uh, which I believe is a, it's a seasonal stream. It doesn't necessarily flow all year round, at least that is the, the bucket it is in. Um, it is mapped as having an adramus fish presence. Um, portions of the stream have a mapped wetland, which in that picture on the right, you can see uh, the light blue areas um, are, are mapped wetlands associated with that stream. Um, and from our staff uh, perspective, it may be an intermittent stream or a seasonal stream. Um, I did find some, I went on Wild Fish Conservancy's website. Um, they've got some really good resources of, mapping and uh, all their field work that they've done and, and observations they've made, you can go and click around. Um, so I looked at that and they had uh, some information back from 15 years ago that noted at the time some fish presence and they noted two dams that occur within that stream. Um, and our information that the county uh, has a mapped fish barrier culvert at 73rd Avenue Northeast. So the big fat caveat on all those things is that it's the best information that we have um, on the with the data that's available and any of of this information, the type of stream, uh, what sort of habitat it has, and you know the wetlands that are out there, and what sort of buffers those would potentially command as part of a development project. All that information would be determined in the field. Um, but this was just to give you a, a rough sense of what the information that we had available on this particular feature. And uh, before I move on, a uh, couple touch on a few things that that planning commission asked for that I. Unfortunately, I'm not really able to provide. Uh, there were questions about wanting to look under the tree canopy. And unfortunately, we're kind of limited to what we can see from aerial photography at this stage. Uh, we're not gonna, we, we can't really go out in the field and look at all these and uh, we have to use the data that we have. So uh, planning commissioners are welcome to look at the imagery on the, uh, we've created a tool that lets you look at the different reaches and the SEDs that are proposed, and you can turn that on and off and look at the aerial. So I can send links out to that information if that would be interest, interesting and would potentially give you a better chance at seeing things versus the screenshots here. Um, but that's really the best that we have to work with, uh, unfortunately. And then as far as um, wanting to superimpose the potential buffers on here, I know there was a talk about that as well. The, we don't have the mapping of the ordinary high water mark that would enable us to confidently put the buffer on there. So the rural conservancy buffer would be 125. 
per the Planning Commission's recommendation, and the shoreline residential would be 50 feet. But we don't really have a starting point to put those lines on. Um, the water body that you see, or the you know the lines that are representing Puget Sound, it, it's it's in our water bodies layer, but it is not and is not intended to be the ordinary high water mark. Um, but I can say, you know, in looking at the images, you can see there is a range of distances um, of structures from from the shoreline in general. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have the ability to map that ordinary high water mark at this you know, at this scale. Um, so going into findings and recommendation, and then I'll turn it over to you all. Um, this is the same as I had last time. So it appears that uh, portions of this reach meet different criteria of, of a couple shoreline environment designations, depending on where you're at. It would appear the central portion of the reach has uh, more densely constructed homes that are closer to the water with, with more modification, less vegetation and that other areas appear to contain larger vegetated areas between the homes and water. And as we saw in the topography, um, potentially areas have um, some higher bank to them as well. So my recommendations, uh, as I mentioned last time, there's two. The first one I'll focus on is the actual extent of this reach. Um, it, as you look to the to the left or to the west of this reach, and again, I apologize, I didn't have an image of that. Um, Again, it becomes you know lower bank and uh, homes that are closer to the water, and it appears that this reach here, there's at least one property here right on the edge that um, where I the one drawing this map back in the day probably would have recommended that you know it include that one because that is development that is more um, closely resembling shoreline residential and is right on the edge of another reach that is also shoreline residential. So my first recommendation is to shift the reach line over one um, by one parcel to move that one into um, the reach to the left. And then the second one has to do with the shoreline environment designation recommendation for the whole rest of the reach. And my recommendation uh, would be to take those parcels in the center and roughly approximated by the lines here, the pink lines, and the area bounded in between these pink lines to propose that that be shoreline residential uh, and retain the remainder as rural conservancy. So I will pause there. That was a whole lot of words. Um, and I will turn it over um, to the Planning Commission. Commissioner uh, Kern? Comment. Uh, I reach a shoreline residential. I'll second that motion. We have a motion on the floor for leaving and seconded for leaving that entire reach of shoreline residential. Is there any other discussion? Yeah. Uh, Kevin, uh, Commissioner Pessinger, go ahead. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, Andrew came up with a hybrid recommendation. I was going back through the public comments, just doing a search filter for Zangle. And uh, many, many of the public commenters related to Zangle expressed a strong desire to do exactly that, to have the densely developed rural areas designated, uh, keep the same designation, uh, and to uh, move to natural those areas which are prime habitat. So it's, I think, Andrew's recommendation is very in line with the large volume of the public feedback and comments. Commissioner Wheatley. Yeah, I'm arguing against it as well. Um, and in fact, I would even argue against um, Andrew's recommendation. Uh, I, I think that we need to have some discussion about um, uh, the purpose of the SMP is to enforce the Shoreline Management Act. And I think as a principle, we always have to be most protective of the purpose uh, of the Shoreline Management Act. And that means that we always default to what is the best interest of the state and the people of the state. And it's very clear um, that the best interest is to 
do as much as we can to preserve ecological function. Um, I sent Andrew, and he's probably already got that in his mapping, but I sent a picture to Andrew of the Puget Sound Water Characterization Atlas that shows that that section of shoreline that's actually the more residential one is higher rated for its ecological function, actually. So, you know, we need, we need to think about that. And especially um, the other thing about this is, and I really thank you, Andrew, for, um, for that, that wonderful memo that you wrote. That was just terrifically helpful. Um, I went back and looked at the wax because um, that really helps me to understand the purpose behind um, these zoning designations. And it seems to me that the wax uh, that WAC 173.26.211 um, in its defining of a rural conservancy environment, it specifically addresses bl feeder bluffs and steep shorelines and says that that is a criterion for including in rural conservancy. It's a mistake to think that rural conservancy means you can't have residential um, you know, have residences, have neighborhoods in it. It's irrelevant, I think, whether there's sewer lines or not. It's actually a really wonderful thing um, for shoreline ecological function that there are sewer lines, but it's certainly not a reason not to want to be as protective as possible of that ecological function. But I'm really, you know, this is maybe a policy thing here, which is kind of what we're here to do. Um, I think if you have feeder bluffs on the shoreline, uh, that's an argument for, uh, you know, in this situation for rural conservancy all the way down, especially when, um, when it, it's been, sh there's mapping that shows that that stretch of shoreline with the residences is of ecological importance. Thanks. Commissioner Hansen. Thanks. I, I've been thinking about this and, and trying to take a step back and look at the big picture. And if, if the, the requirement of the Shoreline Master Program is, is no net loss of ecological function, which uh, has been um, commented on by Andrew, and the role of, of our body is to provide a recommendation to the county commissioners that they can adopt, then to allow uh, a designation that allows for more intense development than exists currently in one reach would require that we take away the ability to develop in other reaches because we have to look at this thing as in, in the totality of Thurston County and in, in all the all the parcels that that uh, are fall under the the shoreline master program and I, th I think that if, if those things are the case uh, our default needs to be less development in in each reach. Um, otherwise, if we look at it just piece by piece by piece, as well, it makes sense that we would allow further development here because look at what's around in this reach. We get to the end and we've we've provided a recommendation that the, that the commissioners can actually adopt in accordance with the requirement for the shoreline master program. So I think the default uh, needs to be to the conditions on the ground. And, and so I, I would uh, recommend that, that we leave this in Rural Conservancy. Commissioner Halverson. Uh, I uh, seconded uh, Doug's motion because last week I actually drove out to this location and I looked at it on the ground because it, I was, it was concerning to me about the bluffs and stuff and the cove. Um, all of them have sewer. Uh, everything that's around there. Now, I didn't walk on personal property. I didn't go out and look at the bluffs and go down because that's not something that I do. I'm not going to invade somebody's privacy. But uh, the canopy that um, that Andrew showed is kind of misleading. Uh, there are homes on every one of these parcels. These parcels are very small. It's an older neighborhood. Um, I only found one parcel that didn't have a home built on it. And when I came back and looked at the assessor's website, that parcel is owned by a person that owns the lot next door. 
Uh, <clears throat> so this is, it has been uh, the 1990 SMP, the 2017 update showed this property as shoreline residential. Um, and now we're, we're even discussing the fact that we're gonna change it. What I would say is there were 2,700 redesignations within the county. Uh, I don't know, Andrew, maybe you can explain how many of those have actually been changed from that 2,700 that the county recommended, but I know of only 26 uh, out here at Lake Lawrence and a few at Long Lake. Um, but out of that 2,700, I would have to say that having been to a lot of these meetings and, and seen a lot of these testimonies, I would say it's less than 100 of them that have actually been redesignated back to where they were in 2017 and 1990. Uh, so there's a whole lot of uh, elbow room uh, for this no net loss thing. And to tell residents out here on this point that, hey, you were residential at one time, uh, you took and you paid for a sewer system on your own to put it in to be environmentally conscious. Uh, but we're going to say it's rural conservancy now. This is a tight community, narrow lots, small lots built right up to the shore shoreline because it's a hundred year old community. Um, and Andrew, you can tell us, I don't know this for a fact, but when I went back and looked, and you know, I've had problems looking at geodata in the past, and I've had to call you to ask for clarification on it. But when I looked at it, that uh, reach to the uh, north of this inlet uh, was conservancy, uh, which means there's a 250 foot buffer uh, from that reach, which would stretch all the way across that cove. So that would be, that would impact anything those people down there in that cove would want to do, even though it's, this cove is, uh, this reach is designated rural, uh, shoreline residential, they would still be impacted by those same rules of that 250 foot buffer. Um, and when I looked at the maps at geodata, the creek, and majority of that cove were not within that reach. Now you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I saw looking at the uh, the boundaries and the geodata. And like you said, you, it's kind of hard to tell where the high water mark is to get your distance off of that. Um, but yeah. we have a whole lot of buffer with that 2,700 parcels to get to no net loss. This is already a net loss. This is a highly impacted residential area and I think it's crazy to not designate it as that. Thank you. So I would, uh, I would like to say that uh, I do believe that um, having this as shoreline residential would actually be the same as what it has been prior. So there would not be a, a loss calculation done on it because it would be a status quo. I would also uh, like to think that because of these high banks and uh, the possible creek there that there are other areas of county code that would address protection of these areas including the critical areas ordinance for uh, steep slopes and for wetlands and streams so i don't think that an sed change to a more protective sed would actually do anything that isn't already being done by other parts of the code nor would it impact a uh, no net loss calculation because it would be just um, the same. So uh, that does bring us back through the roll again. So Commissioner Carmen, if you'd like to say something again, go ahead. Uh, you just, I'm sorry, I left my hand up. I, you just said what I was gonna say, Eric. All right, do we have any other further discussion on this? Yeah, um, Thank so you. I was looking at this and Scott, I think we lost you. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm back. So there's two places in the designation criteria that uh, mention Lamberts. Shoreline residential environment says assign a shoreline residential environment designation to shoreline areas inside urban growth areas, incorporated municipalities, rural areas of more intense development or master plan resorts, if they are predominantly single family or multifamily residential development or planned and platted for residential development. 
and the part that's up here that I think has been missed, and I I've, I'll be honest, I kind of missed it too, going through the designation criteria for con rural conservancy, you've got A, B, C, D, E, the next paragraph is areas designated in a local comprehensive plan as limited areas of more intense rural development as provided in chapter 3678 or 70A, may be de designated an alternative shoreline environment provided it is a, consistent with the objectives of the Growth Management Act and this chapter. So, I mean, I think this is clearly a lammered. And the two things that we have say that shoreline residential is a lammered and that even if it is, looks like rural conservancy, if it's lammered, we can make it something else. Is that it, Scott? Scott, are you done? Yes. Oh, okay. Commissioner Wheatley. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to hold up the vote for too long here, but I think um, Scott's comment um, points to some further discussion that I think we need to have uh, about proposed revisions to the to the SMP. We have to remember that that this is going to be under the new SMP, whatever that is. And there may be some revisions to explore. I think that the, you know that these that that all of the the areas being presented tonight raise kind of interesting and important policy questions about um, about those designations. Um, and and I think that there's a sort of a gray area. I think that the reason that they're before us is that there are some kind of uh, gray areas uh, that that these fall into. And we should really, at some point, have an opportunity to talk about um, where Paul, you know, how how the SMP should address those kinds of things, where um, where you have kind of a a uh, the overarching shoreline management act and its purposes and goals and how that's going to apply because Thurston County is a highly developed shoreline kind of a county um, and and so I just see these as kind of larger policy questions and and I don't believe that um, just because it's a lammered means that the whole thing um, that that's the only thing to consider. Sorry to be so long-winded. It's all right, thank you. Is there any other discussion on the motion? Uh, I just wanna point out, that's not the only thing I'm considering. The biggest thing I'm considering when I look at this is how highly developed these properties are already. And I question whether changing the designation to rural conservancy or shoreline residential is going to make much difference in ecological function because I look at these properties and say, these people have already built out to a certain point and either way, they aren't gonna be able to build more on these properties. Well, that's, that's why the bluffs are kind of an important consideration for this one, I think, because that kind of goes to that. And we also, I think, need to spend some time looking at sort of what the management policies are around those designations, because I, I, uh, that, that's where, um, you know, we need to be looking at this from the shoreline inwards um, to be applying the Shoreline Management Act. But you also have to remember, we also have critical areas, which is going to, which is actually what is going to decide on the bluffs what you can build and what you can't. All right, well, we have a, a motion on the floor. The motion is to 
change reach MBU 15 to MBU 16 to shoreline uh, SED of shoreline residential. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Eric? Yeah. 16 to 17. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me restate that. The motion on the floor is to change the the reach of MBU 16 to MBU 17 to Shoreline Residential. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. 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 Motion carries. Andrew, we're ready for the next one. Okay. Is there a, a, a any conversation about moving the reach break line uh, to include? Well, I guess it wouldn't. Maybe it, that might be a moot point at this point. Okay. That would be a moot it point is. since okay. yes. both sides. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I just to touch on a couple things briefly um, before we move on here that I just heard in conversation. Um, I so I want to. Correct. Uh, I think it was Commissioner Halverson who said that a lot of the creek is not in shoreline jurisdiction. He's absolutely right. I, I brought back that information just based on the conversation last time. Um, but yeah, most of it's not in the SMP jurisdiction. Um, it flows through it. And that portion that's within 200 feet would be covered by SMP, but the rest would be critical areas. Um, as far as the reach to the right here, um, yes, that reach is proposed to be conservancy. Um, I think it is conservancy today. And if that is the case, it would have a 250 foot buffer based on the critical areas update from 2012. However, that buffer goes from the ordinary high back onto those properties only. It doesn't go forward across the cove to, um, to the properties we're talking about tonight. So for the marine shoreline, the buffers are in one direction backward from the ordinary high. That if we were talking about a stream, you know, you'd get a buffer on both sides of it. But in this instance, it's just just on um, the sound. Um, and then a couple other things, but I, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and move on. Uh, but one point I would also bring up um, just in general for any of these things and just to let everyone know um, if there is not a consensus or there is a minority opinion in addition to the majority opinion uh, or motion, those are certainly things that uh, Planning commissioners are have the ability to put forward uh, minority reports for any of this information. So, um, yeah, Andrew, I think we're gonna we're gonna ask for a minority report on on all of this to be forwarded with uh, the regular planning commission recommendation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Commissioner okay. Carmen, did you have something? Yes, I do. Um, just as a comparison, um, we just made this decision on the, on these reaches here and and as everybody said this is densely uh, residential there are other areas that i know of which are what i would consider natural and are currently uh, designated as shoreline residential and uh, and and as and, and proposed to be under the new designations to be shoreline residential um, it doesn't happen to be one of the parcels that you've got listed to talk about, but um, I would certainly like to look at some of these if we think that they should be uh, upgraded or downgraded. I'm not sure which way you want to you want to call it. Um, we ought to be able to put those in there. Thank you, Doug. Andrew, we're ready for the next one then. Okay, great. Moving on. New territory. Okay, so the next one we're going to talk about here uh, is a portion of a reach out on Long Lake that's known as Carpenter Park. We did receive several comments about this one as well during the SMP uh, public hearing. So here is the, uh, the, on the, again, the left side of your screen, upper left, showing you a general location of this reach and Long Lake out here. Uh, it's just east of Lacey. And uh, here is a zoomed in photo or photograph, the bottom left here that shows that parcel and what it looks like. In the middle of the screen here, uh, I have a snapshot of the entire reach bounded at the very top and the very bottom of that photo with pink lines and the relation of where, or the position of this parcel in relation to that reach. And then on the right hand side, again, there's the parcel and that's showing you the portion that's mapped in shoreline jurisdiction, which as we all know is 
it's the map. So uh, this parcel is part of the larger reach, LLO4 to LLO5, Long Lake 4, Long Lake 5, uh, and is represents about 1,200 linear feet of shoreline. Currently, uh, this, this is zoned or is designated as rural. It is proposed to be shoreline residential, which again is that walk across. Uh, it's the most analogous to the rural designation. And the citizen request, what we heard was uh, to consider rural conservancy or natural on this one. So here are, uh, we got several comments on this one. Again, there's all the letters that we got. Um, and so some of the things that folks talked about were that uh, this is one of the last undeveloped areas on Long Lake. They mentioned fish and wildlife habitat that it provides, including wetlands uh, and the recreation it's provided in the past. Uh, it's across from a public park and is part of the view shed for folks who use the lake. And a lot of folks uh, discussed concerns about impacts that uh, shoreline residential SED could allow uh, in the development that could go along with that. Uh, we are also aware that this property is currently subject to a county compliance investigation based on recent alterations that have occurred out in the property. Um, to my knowledge, um, the landowner is still in the process of addressing those issues. So all the analysis you're going to hear tonight focuses on the condition of this property prior to, to any of that activity. All right, so again, here's our reach and our criteria. And then everything that came out of my brain when I looked at this. So is this, uh, looking at the criteria for natural, um, is it ecologically intact? and therefore currently performing an important irreplaceable function. Um, the reach as a whole most certainly is not. Um, this parcel does appear to be more heavily vegetated than other areas within the reach. Uh, the shoreline does contain a dock and a swim area. And we do know that there was you know, a, a long history of recreation on this property. It used to um, be a, a, a private recreation property for local carpenters union. So I have not been out to this site. I have not been on the ground on any of these. Again, we're looking at things we can see from the air, but I am aware that you know it has had a past a lot of past human use. Uh, is it ecosystems or geologic types of particular scientific and educational interest? Nothing that was noted in any of the reports that were done before uh, proposing designations for this reach. Um, is it unable to support new development or uses without significant adverse impacts to ecological function or risks to human safety? The property is heavily vegetated in shoreline jurisdiction. So development, you know, dense development could introduce significant impacts. Uh, any development would need to demonstrate no net loss. And it is mapped with steep slopes, which would be a potential safety hazard. But of course, that would need evaluation during the land use process, land use review process. Um, does it include largely undisturbed portions of shoreline areas? Um, the vegetation appears to be intact through photographs from the air, but again, I have not been out there to verify this, and we do know that this property has had, um, you know, a history of recreational use. And does it retain the majority of its natural functions? Heavily vegetated, haven't been on site, I can't tell you a lot about that other than there's a, you know, uh, native vegetation, you can see a lot of Douglas firs, um, shoreline configuration, um, I, can't, I can't specifically comment on that. Um, again, there is a large dock that is visible, uh, unsure of what other modifications might exist in shoreline jurisdiction. Moving on to rural conservancy for this parcel. Um, is it outside the incorporated municipalities and urban growth areas? Yes, it is. Is it currently supporting low intensity resource use? It has had those uses in the past, uh, re recreational use, uh, but currently, uh, don't know, don't know what's going on out there. Uh, is it currently accommodating residential uses? It does not appear to be within shoreline jurisdiction. However, uh, there is at least one home that's on the property I found in the assessor's records. I believe it's outside of shoreline jurisdiction. Um, and can it support, or is it supporting human uses but subject to limitations? Yes, it has supported human use in the past and theoretically could. Again, I'm not exactly sure what it's currently supporting out there. Um, uh, but there are no homes that I could see within shoreline jurisdiction. Uh, but it does have lim oops, map limitations uh, owing to the wetlands and the steep slopes. So can it, oh, sorry, I went ahead. Um, can it support low intensity water dependent uses without significant adverse impacts? 
Based on the current condition I can see and without being on the ground, that may be a better way to preserve ecological function. Again, there is some development out there that's occurred with the dock and swim area, um, but a lot of it does appear to be heavily vegetated. And it's private or publicly owned lands of recreational or historic cultural potential public access value. Nothing was noted for this specific parcel in the reports that I reviewed, the inventory and characterization or the said report. Again, it has historically been used for private recreational access and theoretically could have that potential in the future, but you know, I, I won't comment on the what the current owner is doing with it or plans to do with it, because do not know. Um, and then that it does not meet the designation criteria for the natural environment. Um, it may meet some criteria, uh, as I discussed previously, but you know, unsure on un, do not know for uh, all of those criteria. So uh, can't really confirm that. So looking at this versus the shoreline residential criteria, which again is what it currently is, it's rural and it's proposed to be shoreline residential. Does it, uh, it doesn't meet the criteria for natural resource conservancy, uh, rural conservancy. Uh, again, it may meet the criteria for some of those potentially. Is it predominantly single family or multifamily residential development? The majority of the reach does appear to meet that criteria. However, this parcel um, is larger, it has not been subdivided, and uh, does not uh, currently appear to have residential development in shoreline jurisdiction. Is the majority of the lot in shoreline jurisdiction? Again, that appears to apply to the majority of the parcels in this reach, however, not to this specific parcel. And then have ecological functions been impacted by more intense modification in use? Uh, did not do a site visit, um, but there does not appear to be intense modification in use within shoreline jurisdiction. Um, from the aerial photography, you can see a lot of vegetation. Um, so significant impacts, um, not, not visible. So the findings that I had for this one are that this reach is pretty unique within this reach. It's really large uh, and only has a portion within shoreline jurisdiction. Uh, a lot of the area within shoreline jurisdiction does not appear to have been significantly developed and it appears to retain dense vegetative cover, uh, whereas the majority of the other parcels in the reach are more densely residential development. So staff recommendation or options for you to consider would be um, that the parcel does appear to meet some criteria of both natural and rural conservancy, but not the shoreline residential. Uh, and that is something that ecology agrees with. Um, personally, I believe that rural conservancy may be the best fit if planning commission is going to consider uh, changing this, uh, given the pictured condition uh, and what we know about the, the past use and level development that may be out there. Uh, and uh, if the designation does change, we could do that by either, you know, doing it within the original reach. And so you keep the reaches as they are and just have a portion of that reach change to a different designation, uh, or we could create a new reach break. Uh, and talking about that with ecology, they've commented that, you know, the county does have smaller reaches than, than is represented by the distance of this parcel, their length. Um, so there's precedent for doing that. Should planning commission want to recommend that? Uh, and, you know, in the personal opinion of staff I talked to, uh, she said probably should have been its own reach to begin with, regardless of the designation, but just that it is, you know, different in characteristics and, and the size of it. So, I'm going to go ahead and pause there and turn it over to uh, Planning Commission. Andrew, could you uh, tell us uh, from from a staff point if we do want to break this out from the reach? Is that is that? An, I, I think that it, it'd be very easy for the Planning Commission to decide that this should be treated differently than the rest of the reach. Would it be an easier thing to? Uh, call it out specifically within that reach as different or to make new reach breaks? Uh, although it would require more, more work, uh, I think it would potentially be cleaner to just create a different reach. Um, I think there's, there is, I think it, it could be warranted uh, and any of these th changes that we're making again, they're, you know, I'll, I'll feed any proposed changes to our GIS person who will update the maps and we'll make those changes in the supplement to the SED report that goes forward. Um, we're not changing the original documents. So um, I think it would potentially be cleaner to just create a new reach if that is um, what the planning commission wants to do. Thank you. 
Commissioner Carmen. This 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 happens to be the, the piece of property that I talked about earlier. I didn't realize you were bringing it to us, Andrew. So just to give you all some background, I do live on Long Lake, which is where this is. So I have seen this property and been associated with it. The property has not been used for over 20 years. And while there is a dock and uh, the current developer has put in some armoring along the shoreline without permits and done some some modifications and cutting down some trees but if the tree line that you see there is basically the 200 foot setback i mean it would be 200 feet to the tree line that house that you see there is 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 well behind that and that used to be the caretaker's house for the property and all the vacant land you see there where it was campgrounds for the carpenters union people to bring their trailers and their tents and whatnot to access it. Um, so it is it is basically been untouched locked up chained over and everything for um, at least 22 to 23 years that I know of. Um, so it's pretty natural. Do we have any more uh, questions for Andrew on this particular piece? Commissioner Halverson? Uh, yeah, Andrew, uh, I know you may not know this, but uh, so the, the furthest uh, Western yellow line there on the outside of that property, that's the outside of that reach LLO for? Um, this, so what we're, what you're looking at right now is just this parcel uh within the reach i'll back up uh to this slide so this picture here in the middle where the uh where it's circled in pink right uh at the at the at the top and the bottom of that picture you can see uh pink lines that's that's the entire reach llo4 to llo5 this one is uh it's in the middle it's a little bit closer to the north end of the reach but you know it's it almost smack dab in the middle of the entire reach right yeah, I would uh, just like I have with other lakes when they talk about community areas and parks uh, that are not totally developed. I'd recommend Rural Conservancy on this too. Okay, Commissioner Simmons, do you have something? Uh, yeah, just just a comment. This this looks like a perfect piece to just kind of change it to a rural designation or a natural. Um, it seems to fit that and especially since nobody's using it. I don't know what the current owner's plans for it is. It, I don't know if it's still the Carpenters Union or not, but this just seems like a, to, to get it to the shoreline residential, or I mean, to for a rural, is, is, this seems like the perfect one for that. Thanks. Andy, could you tell us what, if there was a consensus on public comment on this particular piece? Um, most of the comments that I read, and I did actually tally them up, uh, the vast majority of them used the, they use a lot of the same language. I think there was some, some talking points that were circulated and a lot of folks use those in preparing their comments. So the most of them said rural conservancy or natural. So they lumped them together. Uh, and so that's why we looked at all, all things here, but, uh, cause that's what I was hoping to, not that that is the deciding factor, but you know, if there were, if there was a, tally and I know that in the past planning commission has been interested in that and so I, I did look at that but they didn't state a preference as a whole one way or the other just that it not be shoreline residential thank you commissioner Wheatley yeah thank you um I have just a kind of a procedural question do you need a motion um in order to take this back and and make your decision um, is it helpful to you to have that, um, or or is it sufficient that there appears to be consensus on this? Uh, I'll defer to the chair to how he wants to to run these conversations, but I think the motion makes it cleaner and makes it better for the record. I, I think that if somebody wanted to offer a motion, it would certainly be entertained. Well, uh, I'd be happy to offer that motion then. Can we um can we finish comments first, then we'll come back to you if that'd be all right. 
Thank you. Commissioner Simmons? Jimmy, you have Sorry, Eric, I just left my hand up. Forgot to lower it. Com Commissioner Hansen. Oh, I was going to offer a motion that we take it in pieces. And my motion was that we make a recommendation to break this parcel out into its own reach. Okay, let's uh, finish up with this uh, conversation, then we'll entertain some motions if that's all right. Commissioner Nelson. Yeah, I got. Have you, Andrew, have you been able to contact the owner of this? I, I know you said that the county has had some issues with him, but. I have not been in contact with them. I, I did, you know, just confirm that that investigation had been going on and, you know, it's in between the landowner and the county working those things out. That's kind of on a separate track of, of what's happening here, but I have not spoken to the owner. Okay, because I guess my concern is we have a landowner who probably looked at the map and said, oh yeah, I'm shoreline residential. I'm fine with that. And didn't come to the maybe didn't come to the hearing, and now you've got people that own other properties saying, you know, that this seems like they're singling out a single landowner. And I agree, it's probably best as uh, residential or as rural resource, but I have a concern about changing the designation of somebody who's not had any input on what we're doing. Andrew, if if we did make a change on this, since this, I don't know if this parcel was included into the 2,700 uh, people that got postcards uh, similar to what Scott was saying, would there be an opportunity for you to send notification to this landowner before uh, the BOCC took action on it? I. I could take that back and talk about that with Chris. Um, we, we could certainly talk about that. Um, we didn't notify folks ahead of time for a variety of reasons because you know changes have not been made, because the public comment period is closed, um, because when we get to the board, we will be reopening that conversation with them about how they want to notify properties. And yes, all, all of the shoreline property owners um, did get notification that the SMP update effort was occurring and how to comment and how to get, you know, how to be able to find out more information from us as a, as a section, as a whole. But that is something we can, we can talk about. Uh, I see Chris turn on her camera. I don't know if she has any comments, but. Chris heard her name. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, they were just saying uh, if, if the planning commission were to make changes on these individual properties, would there be a way to, um, you know, alert the landowner to that. And I said, you and I could, could discuss how to best do that. Yeah, I think we would um, need to go back and look at our budget um, because it does cost for us to do um, notifications. But um, if there are areas that um, have had a significant change, uh, I think we can find a way to make sure that those property owners are notified um, that changes are occurring um, so long as we are targeting our um, notification um, in a limited fashion. So Chris, I think I want to clarify this because my concern isn't, I think the people that like at Zangle Cove, those people are following what we're doing anyways. They made a request to have their property areas changed. My concern is where we're going to single out one parcel and change it, even though we haven't heard from the landowner. I tend to agree with Scott. If we make a change to this singular parcel, I would feel much more comfortable about it if you guys could send this one landowner a note before the BOCC make, takes action on our recommendations. Yeah, and if it's a handful of landowners, if this is the only one, then great. If there are others that um, go like this um, and there are a handful, we can definitely do that. I think it would, I, I, I can't foresee this being a whole lot of them. It, <laughs> yeah. Commissioner Wheatley, did you have something else? Uh, only to make, to make the motion. I'll come back to you in just a second okay. for the motion. 
Uh, Commissioner Carmen. Just to answer Jim's question, um, the developer lives in the house just to the north of that parcel, and their plans are to put 32 homes on this part on this parcel so it'll be broken up into 32 parcels plus a community property along part of the shoreline um, so there will be nine houses built on this bluff within the the two within the tree line and then the rest of them will be built in the back just as background for the rest of you all right without uh, further discussion uh, commissioner wheatley Okay, then I'd like to make a motion that this parcel be uh, designated as um, Rural Conservancy. We have a motion on the floor to, to separate this parcel. Okay. Oh, there was already a motion? No, you, you made the, uh, Commissioner Wheatley made the motion. It sounded like uh, Commissioner Nelson seconded the motion to uh, separate this parcel out and uh, designate its shoreline environmental designation as Rural Conservancy. All those in favor say aye. 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 Nay, all those uh, opposed? Any abstentions? I'm going to abstain on this one. The motion carries. The uh, Long Lake Carpenters Park uh, parcel that is in the center of Long Lake 0 or 0, 04 to Long Lake 05 um, have its shoreline environmental designation set to Rural Conservancy. Um, Andrew, I think that we're running out of time for more SMP stuff and need to move on with the agenda if that is okay. Yes, with one one minor clarification, if I can, did sure. that motion include uh, making it a separate reach as well? It sounded like it might have. But... I, I think separate reach was better. Okay. Unless there's anybody in the group think that that's a bad idea. Commissioner Halverson. That's what I was going to just clarify that the motion was to make it rural conservancy and it's separate reach okay. from the rest of LL04 to LL05. Commissioner Hansen. I just also like the the minutes to include that that it feels like there's a um, consensus here that uh, we also intend that that staff notify the, the landowner of this recommendation. That's great. Thank you, Commissioner Hansen. Commissioner Simmons, did you have something, or was that just? It was like along along the lines of Commissioner Hansen's uh, statement. I I do believe it's very important that this guy this owner, landowner gets notified, especially after hearing what Doug says his intentions are for it. This could be quite the uh, surprise for him if he comes up to the county and tries to get something done. Thank it you. Shall, it shall be done. Thank you. That concludes uh, my work session for the evening. Thank you very much, Andy. That was a good one. All right. Uh, next up on our agenda is staff updates. The only update I have is that the um, board has opened the public comment period for the preliminary docket, um, the comprehensive plan and development code docket. That um, public comment period ends at 5 p.m. on February 16th. And that concludes my updates. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the calendar. And we're looking, is everybody is anybody not going to be available for the February 16th, 2022 Planning Commission meeting? Everybody is available. How about for the March 2nd, 2022 Planning Commission? Looks like everybody is planning on being there. All right, next up on the agenda is Commissioner Wheatley's discussion for our coming agenda. So the floor is yours. Thank, thank you. Um, well, there are a couple of things. I mean, first, what I wanted to um, talk about was just uh, the, um, the agenda uh, design or wording is a little bit off from, uh, from what the rules of procedure state. And 
it, it may be it may be consistent with it, but I think for for me certainly, and I think for members of the public, it would be helpful to take a look at at the rules of procedure where you know the, the order. I, you know, there's what they say really quickly is call to order, public communications, approval of minutes, calendar, new business items other business and adjournment. Okay, so that's kind of the, the order laid out. And I don't, you know, we kind of do that a little different in terms of we approve the minutes before we have public communications. That's not a big deal. Um, we do the calendar at the end. That's not a big deal. Um, but what I'm kind of concerned about is that it's hard for me and I think hard for members of the general public to know when we're talking about new business, when we're talking about carryover business, um, when we're doing things that involve um, actions versus things that are just informational. Um, and so I think it would be helpful to, to, to look at that and think about new business items, other business adjournment, and think about how we might make the agenda a little bit more clear about that. Um, you know, especially separating new business from other business. And, and another element of that is for the new business in particular, I think it would be very helpful to have a um, accompanying statement. Like with this one, we have, you know, work session A19 wireless communication. Well, for a member of the public, they're not going to know what that is. They're not going to know if it's new or old, et cetera. So, so that just concerns me a little bit. And I, I don't know if we need to have further discussion about it or if it's a matter for the chair and the secretary to maybe discuss. Um, but, but it's just kind of something I'd like to, to suggest we think about. And then under other business, I'm wondering if we can make it a regular practice to include um, the next meeting's agenda as part of that, a, a regular part of our agenda so that we know that we're all, as commissioners, we're always gonna have an opportunity to talk about um, help, you know, suggestions for helping to set the next agenda. Because right now we don't have a space in, um, in our agenda for commissioners to to come forward and say, you know, I would like to take a look at this next time or, you know, in a, in a couple of iterations. Um, so so that's that's why I wanted to take this time to just kind of make that suggestion. And I don't know if other people might have things that they want to put on the next agenda, but this is what I was what I was concerned about. So I'll, I'll speak up as somebody who's been chair before. I don't know that staff always knows what's on the agenda for our next meeting, because sometimes it depends on who's available and what information they, you know, sometimes we ask for information tonight. They plan on coming back on us in two weeks, but they can't get that information. So I don't think that we know. The other thing I looked at the, since you said something, I looked at the our rules of procedure tonight. And I don't think that that's, that list includes what needs to be in our agenda. It's not an order. So it, I don't think it matters that we do things in that order. It also says under new business, briefings, hearings, whatever. So I think that covers that those are new business. I'd, I'd also like to say that, um... Before adjournment, I, I will ask if there's any other business uh, for the good of the order. So that would be a good opportunity for anybody to say something that they would like to see uh, shown up. And um, also, uh, just we got to kind of remember too that we don't, even though we approve the agendas and set the agendas, we have a pretty locked in set of side rails about what we talk about. And if it's not on the docket, uh, we don't, it's not our business. And if um, uh, we don't do the prioritization of the docket either, so that comes from the Board of County Commissioners. So uh, it's really up to staff to prioritize our time 
uh, to match how they've been uh, told to prioritize their time. And so I, I think Scott hit it on the head there that a lot of times this needs to be a little bit fluid. And so planning it out uh, for meetings that only happen every other week is a little bit tough. Um, but go ahead, uh, Commissioner Pestinger. Thank you. Uh, we certainly have heard from a large number of members of the public that they've experienced frustration in navigating the information on the website and understanding what the agenda is and what's going to be covered in agenda items. Uh, I personally have been unclear beyond the top level topic of, say, HCP or wireless facilities plan or SMP, in some cases, what level of detail. An example of this, I know there's a very concerned groups of citizens related to the Zangle Cove issue that have attended many of our meetings and would love to know if their specific topic was going to be on the agenda, they would have turned out and paid attention and listened to our meeting, I would imagine. Um, so we've heard a lot of public members say they have a hard time seeing what our clearly what our agenda is and knowing when they should attend and participate. And so I think any effort that we can make to provide added detail or clarity would be much appreciated. That, that's great, uh, Commissioner. Uh, uh, Manager Chapeau, is uh, there anything that we could be doing to add some detail into uh, the agenda so people from the public can get a better idea of what we'll be discussing? Yeah, I think we can. So we do a um, web blast or a web mail blast um, out to those that have signed up um, to get information for planning commission and our other projects. And we create a, we lovingly refer to as a web blurb. Um, and we can take that information that we put in the um, web mail, um, and put that in the agenda. We, we've already created it, so it's not additional work on staff. Um, and it does give a better um, description of what um, will be discussed or what the staff will be bringing forward. We could also um, make sure that we have uh, two buckets, either new business so that you know it's it, you haven't seen it before, um, continued business and post public hearing if the planning commission so would like to see those kind of buckets. Yeah, if you could label them, that'd be great. That'd be... Commissioner Wheatley, did you have anything else on that you'd like? So, um, I just wanna say for staff's sake, I think, I don't wanna get too specific in what we're talking about because then we put ourselves in a kind of a bundle and, you know, maybe we get through something fast, which doesn't happen here very often, but, you know, also I don't want people, you know, like I think on Andrew had all this stuff for the, these different reaches set up for our last meeting. And if we start saying, oh, we're gonna do this, this and this, then people are going to start showing up as a meeting. And if we don't get to their thing, they're going to say, well, I wasted my whole night at your guys' meeting because you didn't, and you didn't get to it. Whereas at least we just say, you know, we're doing shorelines and, you know, this is what we're doing. Thank you, Scott. Commissioner Wheatley, did you have any more on your topic? No, that was, that was good. Um, I, you know, we're at nine o'clock just about, so I don't want to, stretch out people's time too much here. Okay, thank you very much. Is there anything else that, for the good of the order? Kevin, or, Kevin, do you, Commissioner Pessinger, do you still have something? No, sorry, there's no way for me to lower my hand. Oh, okay. Well, with that, it is 8.58 and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.